Greetings. This is Griff Ruby, the Nostalgia Catholic, now taking by on the next uh, Isaac Asimov short story, another entry into the robot series, this time titled Little Lost Robot. There it is in the table of contents. And, um, well, Actually, it gives the wrong page. The real page it appears on is 111, 120. Okay. So, this is kind of vaguely set in a time where travels to uh, hyperspace are beginning to be experimented with, and so that's just kind of setting the era. There's a blurb here. It says, Lost, as referring to a robot, is a little hard to explain. The robot knew where he was, all right, but nobody else did, and they absolutely had to find him. Okay, so how did this happen? Well, we have a picture here of some guy, the one who had business telling a robot what to do, said to the robot, get out of here, get lost. And he said it was such emphasis the robot decided to do just that. He decided to lose himself. So, let's see. Is there another artwork? I think there is. Yeah. So, now later on, they've got him immersed among 62 other identical robots. Strangely, none of them had serial numbers. Whose idea was it to not have serial numbers on these things? That could have solved a lot of problems right there. But then you don't have a story, so okay. So at one point they're actually questioning maybe I don't know, maybe this is Susan Calvin or one of the other people involved. Questioning a robot, trying to come up with trick questions that will somehow be different if we're talking about the one robot because you see, he is designed with some very slight change. A little tweaking was made to the first law. It says that the robot shall not harm a human being nor allow a human, through inaction, a human being to come to harm. But the second part somehow sucked out. Just, he won't harm a human being. That's all. So, a human being could be in trouble and he'd do nothing. Now, they wanted a few robots like this, very temporarily and for a very specific purpose, um, namely to work around gamma radiations where human beings might fleetingly be exposed to gamma radiation and that could harm a human being, although if it's fleeting enough, it really do doesn't harm a human being or not, not enough to make a difference. Probably as much as getting some dental x-rays or something because it's a very low and brief nature of the exposure. Still, I mean, if you just stood there in that stuff for however long, you know, it would, it would hurt you. So the robot would feel obliged to push you out of the way and not let you do basically your job. So they had to make these robots a little bit passive in that area. They still won't hurt you, but they'll let you destroy yourself necessary, you know, because there's no reason for them not to. So, this one robot somehow got mixed in with a shipment of other similar robots. And the whole story is just devoted to trying to kind of sniff that one robot out. Unfortunately, the problem is the robot isn't just carrying out the order of getting lost. I mean, a mere order could be, uh, you know, retracted Concomitant with you know subsequent orders and so forth. Somehow the robot it's it's got an ego, like it's not really a machine programmed in a certain normal way. It's it's like a being with an ego, with pride. It takes pride in uh, being able to fool everybody into thinking it's one of the other 62, so that no one will know the difference. And, uh, in fact, this gamma ray thing is the one thing that does trip it out because 
apparently it was a new robot being shipped in that hadn't yet been uh, settled in and trained for the the actual use where there's these gamma radiations. So he doesn't know how to detect if there's gamma radiations or not. The others all knew. And basically, you know, it's all these different things. They come up with things like, well, we'll pretend to drop a weight on a person. And obviously, if you're a robot, you're going to get up and do something, you know, try to protect the human being, get him out of the way, stop the weight, something, you know. But if you don't have this other part of the first law, you just sit there. But it turns out that if there's something between you and there that would destroy the robot, then there's no point because you'd just be destroying yourself and the human might still be killed. To say nothing of the fact that they're not actually risking the life of the human being. It looks like it's, it is falling and then it uh, gets stopped in some other way. Um, and that's very specifically and deliberately made to happen that way so that the human, of course, does not actually get injured. So I wonder how long before the robots just figure that out and could just decide they can all just sit there and not concern themselves. So a lot of tests in that area kind of failed. So, I mean, the way the robot loses the story is kind of clever. The difficulty it takes in... Uh, in sniffing him out is also kind of tedious and clever and, and so forth and then when you finally come up with the solution you know it too you know has some some degree of cleverness the bit of a robot having cried like an ego or something though is kind of weird um one thing though is as we're moving towards the later stories there comes to be less and less stuff that has to be changed or fixed or tweaked in order to um, incorporate it into the uh, iRobot. So in this case, in fact, surprisingly little is done. The main thing, of course, is a whole prologue to that story wherein um, Susan Calvin is telling this whole story about when I did see Susan Calvin again, it was at the door of her office. Files were being moved out, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And uh, it was a simple robotic in invention, you know? Not just like that. But, of course, until we developed the brain, we heard about the brain in um, Escape, or Paradoxical Escape, um, we didn't get very far, but we tried. We really tried. My first connection with interstellar research was in 2029. When a robot was lost, and then we launched into the actual uh, stuff there. So, what do we have? All right, one twelve. There's a few things where something gets cut out. So let's see. Perhaps the general felt his predicament anticlimactic. He continued with a note of desperation. I needn't tell you the importance of our work here. Since the first imperfect hyperdrive was constructed, the government has spared no effort here. More than 80% of last year's appropriations for scientific research have gone to us. Um, there's a whole big chunk sucked out of the middle of that. Um, let's see here. Perhaps the general felt his predicament anticlimactic. He continued with a note of desperation. I needn't tell you the importance of our work here. More than 80% of last year's appropriations. See that whole bit about how they're spending all this money on the hyperdrive and all that? It's all gone. Don't know why, because that's what was going on until we at least viewed that I could see. Um, then, the very next paragraph, we talk about a rental fee for use of our computing robot. It's changed to computing robots, whatever. Well, the computing robot originally was the reference to the brain that we had in Paradoxical Escape that they were so worried might get injured by um, causing human beings to disappear momentarily and reappear as they go through the jump, as Asmoth would call it. So, that's that brain. Um, there's another place a couple pages later, where for some reason... Colin ruffled his forehead and smoothed it with his upward gesture. It's changed to stroked it. Whatever. Um, I have to move to another. 
I'll get further into the story. Um, the okay. Oh, uh, yeah, Calder had worn its universe in its fullness, which we found in its entirety. Yeah, just minor wording changes. All right, 123B6. Okay, I'm trying to talk about a neurotic necessity. Robot getting neurotic? Neurotic necessity of outwitting humans or trying to outthink humans. Okay. Alright. Um. Well, let's see here. So, what are they, what are they gonna do with 63 robots? One of which is the one they're looking for, and the others are others. They'd like to avoid having to destroy the other alternative to destroy them all. So the guy says, well, I don't see how I can order 63 robots separately on the base without trouble. We'd have, we'd have to take them out of the ship. We'd have to place cars over each one, since you haven't even narrowed down the possibility, meaning no offense. So far, we've managed to keep this predicament of ours secret enough. We've explained away our tests plausibly. Guarding 63 robots all over the place. So, that one, of course, gets a whole lot easier here. Well, there's a whole big chunk out of that. They just simply just change it to just, just directly into all over. We'd have to store them all over the place and just leave them at that. All this other stuff about guarding them and taking them off the ship. I don't know, that's a box mix. One point seven. Alright. Manage job. Destroying three robots. One twenty six B. So I'll just turn it on. I'll just Some few words get dropped out, and then finally the directorship becomes permanent directorship. It's all a little stuff. Interesting to note, though, for the first time, no iteration of the robotic laws had to be taken out or altered in any way. So that's kind of the first. That kind of shows that other than these little, very minor editorial fixes, we're getting to the point where the stories are more mature. The pulpishness of his earliest stories is virtually gone. At most, you could say he throws in a detail or two that are not necessary. So, the stories are coming along. It's a fairly decent story. I, it's not up with the best of them, but it's a good one. And uh, that's all I have to say about that. Thanks very much for listening.